so we're going to go from digital content creation to physical media, as my husband likes to call it. Um, the panel that we have up here, um, I uh, am particularly passionate about. Um, we've got um, some authors here that write every kind of book you could imagine. If you've ever thought you wanted to write a book in your life, this is the panel for you. Um, so we have got Brittany Gibbons right in the middle. Um, Brittany is a New York Times bestselling author. Um, I read her second book in 24 hours. Um, she's a TED speaker, body image advocate. She's all about fashion. I love it. Um, and an internet personality. Um, if you are not friends with her on Facebook, make it happen. Um, so her latest book, which I just said I, I read in 24 hours, is um, The Clothes Make the Girl Look Fat. Um, it does not matter what size you are. Uh, it is a fantastic book for every woman in the world. Um, it was released in December. And her first book was Fat Girl Walking, which I think I read in 48 hours. So, um, you know, kids, there's a new baby in this it. situation. <laughs> um, and then we also have Amanda Formaro, which many of you know as a food blogger with 20 years experience. Amanda um, also is very heavily involved in the craft industry. You have five books, five craft books um, for kids. Um, I actually have a couple of them that I do stuff with my four-year-old. They're awesome. And then Christina Lane, writes for Food, food Fanatic. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Um, that is not her most important title. Um, <laughs> Christina Lane has written three books now, three cookbooks, um, and is also the author of the blog DessertForTwo.com. Um, her small batch recipes have been featured on the Today Show, QVC, The Kitchen, Red Book Magazine, Better Homes and Gardens, and Food Fanatic. Yay! Yay food fanatic. All right. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with the, the audience. And away you go. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so I guess we start with the button, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, here we go. So... We all kind of sat down and thought we would just put things together for you a little bit. And then I think it's really going to be more of an open kind of a session, don't you think? Yes. Right? I okay. Lots of questions. Yeah, there were a lot of questions that were submitted to Mediabind, so we tried to answer s several of them. I don't know that we got them all, so I'm sure we'll make it under an hour. <laughs> we'll yes. Open so up at the end. What we'll start with yeah. is kind of breaking down like what our individual writing processes were. Right. Because they're vastly different. And mm -hmm. so we'll share that with you, kind of give you like a foundation. And then we'll go into some of the questions that were already submitted. And then we would love to answer any of your questions. Yes. Okay. So my process is very similar to that of a cookbook author. So anyone here that if we have food bloggers and craft bloggers here, you already know that writing a tutorial, you have to be, or a recipe, you have to be very concise. You have to explain things well. Um, and I had to do all of that, but I also had to do it for children. So it was really important that, because these were for like grade school age children, so they were going to be making these things themselves and, and reading the books themselves. So I had to not only write that very well where they could follow the instructions themselves but also fit it within the publisher's guidelines. I only had so much room on each page and so my process was just like writing my blog but a little more condensed. Okay, um, well I was a blogger. I started blogging in 2007 and I always kind of went into it. I went to school for an English degree thinking that I was going to be this brilliant novelist. I got into blogging. I didn't get a book right away or any of those things and I sort of broke up with that idea to write a book because I fell in love with the um, instant nature of the internet. You know, you could create something in an hour. You could create an empire in a day. The concept of publishing suddenly sounded very archaic and slow to me. So I was no longer interested in it. So when publishing came back into my periphery, a chance that sort of came across um, what I was doing at the time, I really thought it was going to be a really romantic experience. Like, I don't know if you've ever watched like, um, like the movie Funny Farm or like um, any other movie about like writers where they have like this gorgeous like office um, that overlooks, <laughs> you know, like ponds. And they write with like spectacles on typewriters. And um, none of that worked for me. Um, I spent a lot of time just watching movies off my DVR during the day. 
And I wasn't really inspired or anything. Um, and so I had to sort of break up with the idea of what writing a book was supposed to look like and sort of find where I was happiest writing a book, which turned out was a lot of time in school pickup line um, into my iPhone. Or while I was making dinner, like hunched over a counter on my kid's notebook that I'd rip pages out of, that's what my book writing process began to look like. And because I write memoirs, um, I, I write humorous women's memoirs, a lot of my process involves sort of laying out the narrative of what the book's going to be in a chronological order. So I, oh wow, there you go. I'm watching. This slide. So, I guess <laughs> so I make an outline, um, just obviously, just like you did in grade school, a chapter breakdown, sort of like covering what I want to cover. Each of my books sort of deals with a specific time in my life, um, which makes it a little bit easier. Uh, know that it's okay to write out of order. I certainly did. Like there were more emotional stories that happened early on that I just really didn't want to write at the moment, and I found forcing myself to do that was not effective. So I wrote a lot of this, a lot of my books out of order. I um, also ate a lot during that process. So much food, a lot of Pepsi and Oreos. Um, <laughs> and then one of the best tips that I got was actually from my agent, and it was to bury the dead. And what that means is. I wanted to write so many things, and I think if my books came out with everything I wanted to write in them, they'd be, um, they'd be like a thousand pages long. And so I wrote it to get it out of my system, and then cut it out and buried it. And so I got out outside of me; it just never ended up in the book. I'd like to further expound upon the idea of de-romanticizing <laughs> writing a book. I started blogging in 2010 with the intentions of writing cookbooks. That's what I've always wanted to do. I actually was in grad school reading Bittersweet Vegan. I don't know if you guys read Hannah Kamensky, but she's been in it forever. And I got one of her books, and I saw that she was 18, and she published a book. And I was just so inspired by that. So I got into blogging, and I thought, well, someone will come to me and say, you're amazing. Let's write a book. <laughs> Nobody came to me. Nobody's ever come to me and said, you're amazing. You should do this. I went around and told people I was amazing. I went and I sold my idea. I told people, you have to listen to me. I want to do small batch desserts. This is a small, or this is a segment of the population that isn't being served. And so I told people I was amazing, excuse me, amazing, and made it happen. So there's definitely a, a disconnect. It's not when my blog gets to be this size, then I'll write a book. If you want to write a book, write it now. Um, so I kind of have two, two different slides on what my writing process looks like. Um, can you go back? Yeah, I wasn't sure, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, so after I've signed my contract, I start working. And generally, I've, I've already got a complete book proposal. So my table of contents is already there. I know what I'm doing. So I, I usually do between 100 and 120 recipes, and I divide it up by the number of weeks I want to work. And I do two to three recipes a week. And right now, what works for me is photography first. Um, it's insane. I don't recommend it. I'm stressed out doing it that way. But I have to get my photos done before my brain empties enough to write. That's just <laughs> how I am. Um, yeah, it takes me at least a year to write every book. Right now, I'm on about 18 months for book number four. It's, it's getting harder. I don't know why, but that's, that's the way it is. You ready for the next nut? Yeah. Um, so further talking about a book proposal, um, someone had a question of what does a book proposal look like. Um, it is your entire, for a cookbook, it is your entire book outline. Um, it's going to include some research on your topic. That means looking up other people who've written books similar to you. They're not your competition. They're actually proof that your book will sell because they're sold. So don't be afraid to look up who else has done something similar to you. Um, if you pull their numbers and get their sales numbers, that really helps when you're pitching yourself. Um, a book proposal is going to have a complete table of contents. First chapter is nice, and if you're going to do your own photography, they would love to see samples of it. <coughs> so we should talk about self-publishing versus traditional publishing. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, you so we have a couple different. Are you self-published or traditional? I, I'm. Well, I'm kind of a combination, right? Okay. Yeah. Traditional. Traditional. Yeah. Also, um, so there's some pros and cons, obviously, with both self self publishing. That means you get complete creative control of this process, which is actually a really huge <coughs> thing. Um, it's something that you don't obviously find a lot in traditional publishing. You get to control um, what your book looks like, uh, <coughs> the photography, the cover, all of those things. Um, you are at the end of the day the one that has the final say on it. It's also a much faster process. Um, publishing, like you said. Um, is a really slow process. Publishing a book from start to finish is um, at least a year in traditional publishing. That's after you write it. That's yeah. not the writing part. That's like 
turning that final manuscript in, going through editing, doing all that stuff, it's, it's about a year. Um, and you also get higher royal royalties because you're not paying a publishing company. The cons are there are upfront costs. You're investing in your book right now. You are your main investor. You're having to um, pay for all editing. You're having to pay for any cover work, any of artwork, any of the self-publishing things you, you have you have to have front that. Um, there is a learning curve if you've never published a book before. Um, I think there's a lot of great forums now. Yeah, there are. There's Create Space is, is yeah. one of the big ones, right, for yeah. self-publishing. Um, you can go in there and you can, I haven't used it personally, but I know people who have. And you can go in there, you can, um, you choose your cover, you, you have to have a certain resolution of photos, but, and you make sure they're all the same size, but you can upload and you can move everything around. You totally create the entire book. Yeah, and in lastly, it's a hustle, which I don't think yeah. is a surprise to anybody. Right. The hustle doesn't go away in any of these options, but mm -hmm. it's much larger, I think, in self-publishing. Yeah, are we ready for that? Mm -hmm. So um, with traditional publishing, the pros, of course, is there's no upfront cost for you. The publisher handles all of that. Uh, there are monetary advances. You can, usually they will propose a dollar amount to you, you can nego negotiate that like with any other contract. Uh, there's a the sales distribution model. Does, do one of you want to speak upon that? or? They actually already have it in place. Yeah. Um, they know how to sell your book and they have professionals on hand to do that, which is mm -hmm. great because it's really hard to sell your book. If you think it's hard to sell a blog, right. it's times a hundred harder to sell a book because there's so much monetary investment involved in it. And they are investing all that from the start, so they have a fine well-oiled yep. machine right. in place to distribute your book. Um, they also have access to all of those professionals. And I'm not just talking within the book creation, but they also have access to media professionals, publicity professionals, um, other mainstream media professionals. They handle 80% of that hustle. Um, my publishing company, I'm with HarperCollins, the book comes out, I'm assigned a publicist, and they do all of that hustle for me. They schedule all of my um, interviews with magazines, newspapers, television shows. I simply just show up from point A to point B, and, and that's such a relief after having to write the entire book. Yes, for I sure. think they have contacts that we can't have. It, well, exactly. I, know when, yeah, um, sure. I know when I did QVC, the only people who are allowed to go to the QVC meetings are people in the sales industry, and they're invited. You can't just get an email at someone from QVC and say, can I come on the show? They're, they definitely have better contacts than we can get. Unless you know someone, which is awesome. Right. Um, and then the cons being it is a slow process, like I said. It can take up to a year uh, to get that book published after you're finished writing it. Um, obviously, the royalties are going to be lower because you're sharing that profit with a large company. Um, also, if you've gotten a large advance, you actually don't start earning those royalties until you've made back your advance. Yes. Um, so then there's that. And then also you have potentially limited creative control, which is a real thing that I just discovered the second book. Um, because the first book I, I did, just to share a story really quick, um, Fat Girl Walking, it was just a working title for it. And um, when I signed my uh, book deal, it did have some print in there that said that the publisher got final say on cover and title, but I was like, this is a book deal, I don't care what's in here. And so um, I wrote the book and uh, my editor was a woman, my publicist was a woman, everything was going great until it got to the sales team, which was a group of men, no offense men, but they came back and said that a woman would never buy a book with the word fat on it unless it was how to lose it. And so all of a sudden I was like, no, this is the hill I will die on. Like this title, like I didn't even like it at first, but then I was like, we're using it. And so <laughs> I fought for that title for like a solid month and they kept it. Um, and then the first week it actually hit the New York Times bestseller list and I like sent a thank you to that whole sales team. But, um, <laughs> but the second book then, um, and they used a picture of me on, on my first book. The second book, um, they really sort of follow, because it is professionals, they follow sort of the ebb and flow of what's popular with books right now. And right now a lot of graphic covers are popular. Mm -hmm. So um, a picture on that one didn't really fit as much. And so the creative team sent me over a cover and it was hideous. Like it looked like a die cut Christmas card. It was like red with like little bras and skirts punched out of it. It was really gross. And I was like, nope. And but it, I didn't have a say. And so for two months I fought with it. Um, and I almost lost it at the end. And I was just thinking, wow, this is 
-hmm. It's going to be a book Exhausting. that looks terrible. Yeah. No one's going to, I wouldn't right. buy this book. It's horrible. <laughs> At the end, um, we agreed on a mutual cover that we both kind of liked, which is a button up shirt that's like coming up. If any women with boobs know, mm -hmm. yeah, like Stretch. that button thing. Yeah, that so button. So that's happening. <laughs> um, but we agreed on that one. But, um, but I, had, I, I didn't have final say on that. And so it was sort of a shocking realization in this process of something that's so incredibly personal, which is tens of thousands of my words, being put out in a way that I, in the end, have absolutely no control over. Right. Just to share an opposite viewpoint from that, I was completely OK giving up creative control <laughs> because I feel like that's not my strength. My strength is scaling down recipes. I'm, you know, I'm separating the eggs. I felt like. I have no design skills, so I was really happy to give up that control and really relaxed by it. So yeah, it, yeah. it goes both ways. Yeah, it does, yeah. So did we touch on the cons? That it's a slow yeah. process, right? Yep. So for me, uh, it was a little different for me because these guys both pitched their stories where I, I was approached. So um, the publisher found me on my portfolio site where they searched for, I think it was um, craft, designer or something to that, oh, freelance crafter, that's what it was. And they found me and I had all kinds of samples out there and people that I had worked with. It was kind of like an online resume. And they wrote to me and they said, we'd love to talk to you about doing a book. We, so it was a work for hire. They were looking for someone to hire to do the book. The book was their idea. They already had the titles. They knew it was gonna be a series. Everything was already in place. They knew what it was gonna look like. They just needed someone to make everything. Um, they, so we worked together. I didn't actually get royalties. Mine was a flat fee. So we negotiated what I was going to get. There was a down payment, and then I received half the money when I was halfway through, and then the rest at the end. So it was very different. It's a completely different story than most, right? Most people are, are going, I have this idea, and I need to put together you know, a few chapters, and I need to, to get an agent and pitch it, and mine was just completely different. It was like working as a freelance person on the internet, just it was in publishing. Can you talk about how you came up with your number? Did you do hours that would take you I, to work? I actually books? did, yeah. So I, I used FreshBooks at the time, um, and they have a little timer in there. Um, I just decided how much I was getting for freelance work at the time, and I figured out the number of crafts that they wanted me to do per book, and then I kind of just did that math and said, well, I want this much, and they came down lower, and then I went up a little higher, and we came, we met in the middle. And then I knew, I knew if I wanted to make X amount of dollars per hour that I needed to get these done in a certain time frame, right? So I was used to working for, I'd worked for Disney's Caboose and Spoonful, and I would do 15 crafts in a two-day time span. I would do seven one day, eight the next, and then I'd do all the photos, and then I'd write all the tutorials. So it was a three-day thing for one month. Um, and so I kind of did the same thing. I knew how much time I needed to allot for each of those projects, and I would do multiple projects at a time. And at the, at the end, I did keep track with that little timer, and at the end, I did come in um, over my number, so I was happy with that. Yeah. Oh, this is me, traditional <laughs> publishing. Um, I think we talked about it before, about completing your entire book proposal. There's a really great resource guide online for what a book proposal looks like. Um, Jessica Merchant from How Sweet shared it with me. It's um, Dabbling Mum, like M-U-M. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she shares a, an outline that talks about how you need to have your research and um, what your title should look like. Um, I, I want to talk about getting an agent and how important that has been for me. And then, obviously, work hard. It's going to take away from your blog. So this, if this is something that you want to juggle and balance, definitely think about that. How do I find an agent, and do I need one? I think this was a submitted question. Yes. I loved your answer, by the way. Yes. OK. <laughs> I'm team, absolutely, as I'm sure you are. Agents, they're like realtors. They handle all the awkward, messy stuff. If you aren't comfortable selling and buying a house on your own with absolutely no professional involved in the process at all, then maybe you don't need an agent. Um, I am not. I don't like to talk about money with a source that has a lot. You know, mm -hmm. I, it was really uncomfortable for me. Shopping my book is uncomfortable. Um, dealing with the advances was uncomfortable. Creative controls, obviously. Editing qualms, obviously. My agent just paid for itself this last book. Um, so yeah, uh, edit, edit, agents are a huge thing for me. Um, well, and I think, too, that they, um, 
they're more respected, right? I mean, not right. more respected, but the publishing companies are used to working with agents, and I think they prefer to work with agents because agents know the process. They know what needs to be done, and they know all of the, the ins and outs, and it's just easier for a publishing company. Yes, I was, um, I was actually approached by a publishing company first as well. I didn't pitch a book. Um, I was approached uh, after I had a another a random post go viral, and um, I was approached to write a memoir by a large publishing firm. And as I was speaking to them, they gave me a number, and I was like, that's an exciting number, but I quickly realized that I was really in over my head. I was uncomfortable speaking to them on the phone. Mm -hmm. Like I felt like very pushed and guided through the whole thing, and I thought maybe, maybe I need to get an agent. So I will tell you that when I ended up getting an agent, I didn't sign with that publishing firm because working with my agent, putting a book proposal together over the course of the next 30 days, sent my book to auction, which means multiple large houses bid on it. And at the end, I got to choose from the highest bidder. That was a life-changing experience for me getting an agent. It was literally a three times larger advance working with an agent than not. So they paid for themselves a yeah, hundred yeah. times over. Right. I agree with that. I feel like an agent's only role is to protect you mm -hmm. and to get you more money. That's it. Why would you operate without one? The friends don't let friends work without agents. Awesome. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> <Stuff like that. laughs> um, I think the best place to, well, a few years ago, the best place to find an agent I felt like was publishersmarketplace.com. Now I feel like we're so connected in the blog world. We know each other. We're comfortable emailing each other. Friend recommendations is a really great way to go. Um, once you reach out to your blog friends and they tell you their agent's name, if you meet with them, I would definitely ask for references. I would ask for who they've worked with, and you can find out if they're still in a good relationship with them. Um, once you find an agent that you like, you need to write a query letter. Um, that's another thing I got from dabblingmom.com. She had a really great query letter example. And within Publishers Marketplace, they will tell you, the, the agent will tell you how they want to be contacted. Most of them, it's email. Um, when I was doing this seven years ago, some of the people really still liked snail mail. So I printed out my book, my query, and sent it to them. And if they wanted to see my proposal, they, they snail mailed me back. Um, but mo these days, most people are completely fine with an email to contact. Um, another easy way to do it is to Google your favorite authors. That's actually how I started. I didn't know even where to begin to find an agent. Um, so I started looking up authors I loved reading, and it's really easy then to find their agents, um, which is what I did. So I reached out to them, and a lot of them were like, no, I actually already have somebody in this niche, so I, I don't. But I actually found my agent through a referral from an agent who turned me down. She's like, I don't need another funny, humor, women's author right now, but my friend does. And, so, um, and that's how I actually ended up getting my agent, which is somebody you should feel 100% comfortable with because they are going to go to the mattresses for you all the time. So clicking like almost like you're going to marry them is essentially what you're looking for in an agent. Another thing to do is social media. I love Twitter. I'm sure you guys are all on it. Um, agents love Twitter. And they use all of these hashtags that we're showing right now to tell you all the time exactly the books they want queries for. If they're currently accepting queries, what, what, audience, or what authors are looking for, ask an agent. You can ask these agents specific questions. I mean, it's a really great source. A lot of authors use it. It's a great place for inspiration as well. But I find a lot of authors and agents connecting on Twitter all the time. So how do I submit my book to the agent or publisher, and how much should be written? That's you, right? Who wrote these? I didn't write so, a fiction book, but if you are well, writing no, a fiction book. Well, no, it's fiction that the entire, it, yes, yes. You actually have to have the entire book <laughs> right. written. That um, doesn't mean gonna, it's going to look like that yeah. after it's published, but you need to have it done. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Nonfiction, you actually don't need to have the entire book written. You just need a general summary, a chapter breakdown, as in like all of your chapters and at least a paragraph for each. Mm -hmm. And then um, you need to have at least about three chapters written so that they're going to read this and know what your book is probably going to look like. That's that's the goal with this. Is that true also with cookbooks? I would say the first chapter, but yeah. your complete table of contents, which right. is basically your whole book. Right. Okay. You don't have to have made those recipes and photographed them, but just so they can see generally where the, what the style of the cookbook is. Okay. So writing a query letter, it's a great thing to Google and get query letter examples. Um, 
this is your chance to sell yourself. Did you? Did I make this slide? I think I did. Okay. I'm kind of blanking. <laughs> They're all jumbled together. Um, you keep I, going. I think it breaks it down. Okay. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I would open with a quick breakdown of your book. Um, once you're done with that, go into a paragraph that's just more detail about what your book is. Um, talk to your agent. Tell them about your blog. Tell them about your platform. Um, yeah. And if you've had any past published work. Um, I feel like um, something that doesn't really come into play a lot is how much that you are the talent. Um, nobody makes money unless you do the work. So I wouldn't be nervous interviewing an agent or nervous when you're talking with your publisher because you are the talent, you're doing the work, everyone is working for you and we all need to share the same goals. You need to have the same vision for that book. Everybody needs to be on the same page to make a bad pun. Make sure you thank them. Obviously, yeah. close with a thank you, and then attach your work. Um, and and like Christine mentioned, you have agents have very specific guidelines. If you do not meet them, they will not open anything mm -hmm. that you send them. They just trash it, and they don't tell you that mm -hmm. you didn't meet those guys. They just throw it away, and you never hear anything, and that's the end of that. So you so every agent online on their websites um, and profiles will have very specific ways that they're to be contacted with any book proposals. Um, so I highly advise that you research that going into it. So can you write a book without a large social audience already established? Yes. Yes, you absolutely can. Um, publishers and consumers are looking for quality content. They're looking for beautiful photos, delicious recipes. They, that's what they're after. A social following is definitely helpful, more than helpful. Uh, especially if your agreement, uh, your agreement includes earning royalties, you'll definitely want to be able to push your book out to social and, and get your following to buy your books. Um, but it really depends on the arrangement you have, right? Was this yours, Christina? No. Okay. But most publishers will want, hope, or expect you to do some of your own PR for your launch. Um, they're going to hope that you have. Uh, you'll be able to help them push this out. They have a whole, like you mentioned before, they have a whole sales team to push your book out but they also want you to get the word out as well. Uh, the topic of building your social media following is definitely a completely different topic and session that, that could be covered here in more than an hour, uh, but we can provide a few tips that'll help you get started with that. Uh, being active on your favorite social channels is really important. It's the first step to growing that audience, uh, engaging with them, of course, and you know all that. Um, stay engaged as much as possible, start conversations with your, your followers, comment on other people's posts, share your posts in groups that will allow that, make sure you follow the rules to groups. Generate some excitement around your upcoming book, so if you're, uh, you know, if you're a recipe or you're a cookbook writer and you have a recipe following, then maybe do a little bit of behind the scenes like you do on Instagram, mm -hmm. right? Do a little Instagram story, oh, I'm working on my book, just generate some excitement, get people talking about it. Don't just wait until the last minute when your book is out and announce it. You want to start talking about it ahead of time and get people excited about it. Uh, Facebook Live is a good way to get the word out. People, you know, Facebook likes when you get on Facebook Live. So if you get out there and you start, you're making one of those recipes for the book, don't tell them what it is. Be, you know, be secretive, but say, ooh, I can't wait until you guys can see this in my book. So there's lots of different ways to do it. You can also offer a giveaway once your book launches. You can give away a few copies. Your publisher will generally give you a certain number. Um, mine gave me a whole case of them, so you can, you know, you can push those out in, and you can even have your publisher ship them out. You don't have to ship them out. But please promise me that you're not going to put your book dreams on hold until you reach a certain number. Like, oh, when I get 50,000 followers on Instagram, then I'll write my book. If you have a great idea, sell it. Don't, don't wait. Right, before somebody else does. Yeah. So how can I self-publish a high-quality book? Who self? You, I you didn't. didn't. I didn't self-publish. I did not self-publish. No, I had um, to Google this. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I talked to some friends who self-published. It's easy. It is. It is. But it's really just how much you want to invest in the book. You know, you want to hire a freelance editor. There's amazing um, editors, especially if you join any sort of 
self-publishing groups, which I'm in a few on Facebook, um, there's a lot of editors in there and, and they can either just do straight copy editing or even content editing, which I highly recommend. Um, having somebody else's eyes on your content is always a really good idea. Um, buying a good camera and lighting, especially if you're doing recipes. Mm -hmm. And then research your options. There's a lot of different ways to self-publish. There's a lot of different platforms to self-publish on. Um, I think researching that is obviously a huge advantage. Yes. And just touching on the camera and lighting, um, I don't know, I know with my books, I, I did all of the photography and I had to do step out photos and then they had an amazing Photoshop whiz at the publisher that was able to drop everything. But you need to talk to them first too. Everything that I shot had to be on white backgrounds. There couldn't be any shadows because they had to be able to lift those projects off of the white background and drop them into their layout. So that's that's something that you really need to think about if you're going to be shooting your own photos. Did you use artificial light to do that? I, no I did, yeah. most of them, yeah. I used a light box for, for everything and then bounced light and, you know, got as little shadow as possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how do I market my book? It's a hustle. Yeah. And it never ends. It is definitely a hustle. So um, you're going to want to reach out into your existing communities. I run a large women's community called Curvy Girl Guide, which fit in nicely with my book. So essentially, I fostered a large Facebook group of thousands of, inter of women internationally. I wrote a book, and then I set it inside of it, and it perfectly fit and sold within that community. Um, and so doing that was great, because then they all, in turn, shared that book outside. So it was a really great way to, um, to market my book with no cost and without my publisher having to do any of that. In fact, a lot of the, the sort of boots on the ground work for my book is done by women in my communities. Another thing is to pitch articles to websites and magazines. Please do this all the time because every time you do this, you're getting your name out there and your byline reads, you know, Brittany Gibbons' new book, The Clothes Make the Girl Look Fat, came out in December, and then boom, here's the article. So it's websites need content, you're giving them content for free, and you're getting a sell on your book, which is great. Mm -hmm. Create like minded groups around your book topics. Again, I did that. If I was going to write about something else, I would create a group around that as well. Um, and then submit your book to book clubs, which is another thing I like to do um, because I have more of a memoir style, style book. Book clubs um, are always anxious to have engagement with authors. And so I always encourage anybody who uses my book as a book club, I always either Skype or anything involve myself in that because it makes it a little bit more exciting. Um, but it's also a great way to get your book in the hands of 10 to 20 women who are drunk and they take it <laughs> and then give it to all their friends. And it's amazing. I just found out that my um, sales team pitched my book to like some national book club and they work out a deal with the publisher and they print uh, just a lower quality of your book. I think they printed a paperback or something smaller, really thin paper at a reduced price to, to distribute to their entire book club. Wow. So then awesome. it helps hmm. you earn back your advance. You sell five, 10,000 copies right there. And, that, and that's something I didn't even know happened. That was what my sales yeah, team did. Awesome. Yeah. Huh. So what's the most important things that we've learned during the publishing process? I have to say, for me, communication was key. It was really important that I did not rely on text or email. And there was a lot of those flying back and forth. Um, but it was really important to circle back once, or once a week or once every two weeks and just kind of touch base, especially because I was actually doing, I did five altogether, but I did two at the same time and then another two at the same time and then the last one. So, so working on two books, I was working on 100 projects in two different books. And so I had to keep going back and forth with them. And, and luckily for me, they only changed two projects out of every book. So that worked out really good. <laughs> but it was really important to stay in touch with them, send them, you know, I, I did send them a few, you know, is this the angle you want? Is this what you're looking for in this one? Um, so I just, I, I think that was the most important. Yes. Uh, so make sure you read your contract. Go through it with a fine tooth comb. Contracts are pretty standard, but they're written from the publisher's side of things, right? They're protecting themselves. It's your job to protect yourself. So have an attorney go over it. If you know it's going to cost you two hundred and fifty dollars, yeah. it's worth it. It's totally worth it. You need to have somebody go through that for you. Um, and it's not just about the the price that you're being paid. It's about everything. You know, what is going to happen when this happens? You just need to have somebody go through all that for you. Um, let's see. It's real. Okay, so that's it for that. Um, 
That's your oh, me. Just one. <laughs> Books are forever. You can unpublish them. Um, no, they can't. actually outlive you. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to remember what you're putting in there. Somebody's going to pick up off a shelf 10 years after you pass away. And you have to ask yourself, is that, this what I want them to know about me? Mm -hmm. Like, it is sort of painful sometimes when you go back and pick up a book and see how greatly you've evolved, like from the three years ago when you wrote, wrote that book. There's no go back sees on that. So yeah. on um, your blog you can go back and redo a post. Yeah. But you can't, you can't go back do that. and redo your book. You can't do that on the bookshelves. You can't like cross it off in every Barnes right. and Noble. So and also just appreciate the process. It is very long, but I am so glad to have had those like moments of thought to go back and like maybe I didn't want to talk about my high school boyfriend that way. And I took I took that one out. So having like the gravity of time actually worked in my favor a lot of times and gave me a little bit of clarity. And maybe I wasn't so like hate writing that part of the book. Once I calmed down a second and ate, and I was like, oh, you know, I was hangry. <laughs> yeah. That chapter was just a hangry chapter. And so I, I, I appreciated the slowness of the process in those moments. And, and mine's actually a little opposite of that. So I had a deadline, and it was pretty quick. I had to get two books done in three months, and then the other two books done in three months. So, it, and then the last book, was a Star Wars book, and so that had to be, yeah, it was awesome. But that had to, they had, and that was even harder because everything had to go through, not just through my publisher, but through Disney. So yeah, and then had to come back around. So that one I had, it felt like an even shorter time frame, but the times that they had it was longer, like get it back to me. So it was pretty stressful, but it was, I, I feel like it was great because it wasn't drawn out so long for me, and I wouldn't. I'm a I'm a terrible procrastinator. I'm like last minute everything, <laughs> and so it was better for me to have that short deadline. <laughs> um, I'm. We talked about this, but I think the most important thing is to protect yourself with an agent and a contract attorney. Um, but we we really touched on it before, but. I want you to remember that you are the talent and nothing works without you. Nobody makes any money without you. So align yourself with people who see your career path. I know when I was interviewing my agent back in 2011, I wanted her to share my vision that I was not a one and done book. Uh, writing a book wasn't something on my checklist. I wanted to write a series of small batch baking or cooking for two. And I was in this for the long haul. And so I wanted somebody that I could have a lifelong relationship with because your agent really does have your royalties for life. Um, and I also had to clear that with the publisher that I wanted to be in this for the long haul. I see a mini bakeware line for me. I want to do Food Network. Like I want everyone who is in my circle to see my vision. That's the only way it works. OK. Questions. <laughs> so if you have any questions, is, are these microphones on so we can hear? OK, if you have a question, do you want to come up to the microphone so we can hear you? So everyone can hear you? It was super hard to hear in the last session. I know, so. yeah. yeah. OK, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. OK, my question, I want to go back to when you're talking about pitching magazines. So what is mm -hmm. the timing of that before a book launches? And what is the process of reaching out to like a really big magazine and saying, I want to write an article for your magazine? OK. Good question. Do you know where to find those contacts? No. If you ever open a magazine, go to like the second page. There's a big list of people who contribute to that magazine. I think in high school, we learned it was called the masthead or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what it was? Yeah, find those emails, yeah. start pitching them. Um, so magazines work quite a bit in advance. I'd say at least six, six, six to 12 months yeah. Yeah, before coming out. You kind of want everything to hit um, in the weeks coming up. So an article can be discussed six months in advance. Um, however, so a lot of the articles that I wrote, um, I had, so for example, this last time I had an article coming out timed in Cosmo with the release of this book. It, it ran three weeks before my book came out. So pre-orders are hugely important to authors. Mm -hmm. There's actually nothing more important than a pre-order. You're setting demand for the book. It is literally the most important thing that an author can get is a pre-order. They can start about a know. month before? Mine were actually about six months before. And I think mine were two. Six yeah. months? Two months. Two months? Yeah. So it, it can vary. But um, so that's when you kind of want to start putting those articles out because you want those pre orders to start flooding in. That's going to determine how many books they print, you know, what, how they think you're going to um, list, if you're going to get in on any of the bestseller lists. That's all determined by pre orders. Um, and so those magazine, magazine articles, um, any interviews you can do, even locally, like that's all going to feed into those pre orders. Anybody else? Yeah. 
No fair, you already wrote a book. I know, well, and actually that's <laughs> part of my question. Is, sure. And I don't know that you will know the answer to this because I think you're already on the other side of it, but I'm curious. Like my first book was a cookbook, query, publisher, all that. That was on shelves early 2007, a year before I started my blog. Before I even started blogging at all. Oh. And then my second one was a few years in and it was a lot harder at that point, my agent had a lot harder time. My advance was half what I got even before I had a blog. And a lot of that, I think, was because the market was becoming flooded. And my question is, do you have a sense, being on that other side, what the climate is in that world now for the, like, I have another idea now, but I'm scared to go back into it, not knowing what the climate will be, the realis the re how realistic it is for someone to publish a book. Is, it, is the market so over flooded that it's... I'm not phrasing my question well, but I'm like, what, kind of what I know what you mean. The possibility though. of publishing, like, what the chances are, so how hard it is. Like edible crafts. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, but then I have a craft. Well, so that's my guess is like. But it's a good it question. So it yeah, after or before I did these books, I actually was. I looked at it. I talked to an agent because I wanted to pitch an idea. I had this idea for this. It was really more adult crafting. And I went, I was so very excited about it. You know, I was ready to start making some projects and put together a, a whole pitch. And I talked to the agent, who was a referral from a friend. And that agent shot me down. <laughs> she just said, oh, no, we're not looking for that right now. You know, that we, we flooded the marketplace with those last year, and it's not what we're looking for. So that was really deflating to me. But then she kind of offered. But here's what we are looking for. So... Maybe what your best bet is to is to look into a couple of agents and kind of ask them what is the industry looking for right now because book publishers don't want to die they want to compete with the internet right they want to keep going and so but they want to put out what they believe to be the hot topics so check with them and see what are they pushing out now and I think the market's still there my agent specifically her agency works with people from the internet and, and crafts and um, personality and all those things, like they are pretty internet specific actually. So because the internet kind of killed off publishing here the past, honestly, the past decade, we're just seeing it sort of try to make amends with it in a way that it's trying to survive, like right. you said, because publishing was dying. So and they know the way to do that is to dip into the internet and try and put it on print in some way. So. My specific agency loves finding people who are doing things on the internet and then putting them into print. I think the market is there. I would pitch it. That's encouraging, just because yeah. I, I went through that slump where yeah. it was so hard. That was around 2000, 2012. And I do feel like now it's adapting. Where oh, for sure. Right, right. Oh, and, no, and absolutely. And it did seem like every blogger you knew, yeah, I mean, it yeah. seemed like every blogger you knew had a, had a book coming out, right? I mean, that's, and you're right. So there was a flooding. Yeah, right. There was a flooding, and they're they're coming up to the surface now. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I work here, but if anyone else has a question, I'll hold mine. <laughs> okay, I'm asking. So, book tours, um, that was always the romantic thing that I always saw in movies, and mm -hmm. like you go on these amazing, and you have the signings, and you're in this. How has the internet impacted that? Is that still an effective way? How does social play into all of those things? Is that coherent? Did you do? Did you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I would say it is romantic and dreamy if you have a publicist book everything for you and you just show up. Um, I did a couple stops on my book tour where the kitchen shop made my desserts for me, which was amazing walking wow. into it. But if you, yeah, if no one is booking for you or taking care of food and cleaning up, I don't think it's as romantic. <laughs> Yeah, it's really yeah. more like going on vacation and you're still doing all the cooking, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is hard. I think my first, my first book came out in 2015, and I went on what felt like the longest book tour ever. So it came out in, I think, May, and I was on book tour till November. Mm -hmm. And I did books, I did bookstores, libraries, because they're all hungry for people to come in, too. Like, they're excited. Uh, if a publisher reaches out and says, I have an author that can come, they're super excited about it. And so I spoke in a lot of libraries. Um, my books are women's humor that are sometimes super graphic, and a lot of times I was speaking to a group of 30 elderly <laughs> library patrons, <laughs> and sometimes it was like they left, but other times, like, they were like the first people like, so about that vibrator. And so, like, <laughs> it could go either way. 
this book was different. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to go on another like horrendously long book tour. Will this be super painful? I mean, keep in mind, like I pinched myself every single day of that life, but it was still really hard. I have three little kids, and it's hard to to leave them and do that. And so this this time around, I was like, you know, what are we going to do? And the nature had already changed of book tours. And unless you're going to sell 50 books mm -hmm. at a book tour. They're not super interested in booking them that way anymore. This book, I'm actually, because it has a fashion skew in the sense of like I talk about just how terrible all the crap I wore in the 90s was, um, I'm now doing a book tour in, in clothing stores. So I'm going into Eloquies and Torrids and places like that and styling women and talking to them and also selling them my book while I do it. But they're excited to have somebody in there doing like a celebrity styling thing. And so the nature of it has changed. So unless you are going to sell 50 books at that, and a lot of times you don't because people already have your book when they come. Right. Yeah. So you're not really selling more books at these stops. So um, unless that's happening it, at the moment, tours are kind of changing. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The internet does help get the word out, though. Sure. For sure, yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious, um, can you hear me? That proportionally, like, income-wise, what do you, do you rely on book income as your primary um, income? Or is it, you know, balanced with your blog, balanced with, I know you do speaking engagements, that kind of stuff. I'm just curious, like, what's the makeup for you guys? So I have a short answer. So I'm Yes, go ahead. So, <laughs> so for me, yeah. <laughs> So for me, it was really more of a freelance gig, right? I mean, I was, I was hired to do a job, and I knew how much I was going to make. So in order to make the best of my time, I, I fit that in. And there was no royalties. There were no book tours. It was nothing like that. It was just a work for hire. And so for me, I, didn't, I did have to put my blog on hold a bit because I couldn't produce content for that and do these books. But I made sure that that when I figured out my number, that that was compensating me for that. That's what you need to do. Um, it took, you know, a, it's like I said, it's a year to write a book. OK. Well, during that year, I had no spare words to put onto a blog. Mm -hmm. Like, they were very few and far between. So that meant traffic was down, money making was down. So any advance that I got had to be more than I made for a year just working online. Like that was, or else I wasn't going to write the book. Otherwise, it was going to be a money loss. Unless you know you can take other things in in mind, like how is this going to change my platform? How is this going to extend these things? Sure, but it is a hit because while you're working that year, unless you have just no sleep time, you just really can't. I couldn't upkeep my current social media while I was writing, and, it, and again, the second time around. So it definitely, the, the number had to be higher than what I was making in a year. For me, it's about 50-50. 50% of my income comes from my blog, 50% from book advances and royalties. Yep. Anyone else? OK. Well, my first book comes out in November, and I'm completely Congratulations. Congratulations. I'm completely freaking out about um, promoting it. Um, so if you guys could give me t any tips or all, all of us tips on how to kind of promote that with social and any other methods that you have. First, what's it called? And we will all pre-order. <laughs> yeah. It's a working title. It's, uh, it's Vertical Gardening. So oh, I love that, too. <laughs> 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 well, step one is always tell people the name of your book uh, when yeah, you get like up to a microphone. No yeah, I don't know the title yet. I know, but I don't know the title yet because it's oh. not coming out till November, so I don't have a cover yet. Okay, I'm working I'm with a publisher, and they're in control. You know how that is. Yeah, yes. I do. <laughs> unfortunately, I don't know any of that yet. But yeah, um, honestly, just start sharing the process now because I mm -hmm. blogged before I wrote a book. Um, I was a lifestyle blogger. I was very, just more of like women's platform. And so I have a huge following of women who just are used to following my day to day. This book process was no different. They loved like kind of getting a back end view like of the, scenes, the yeah. entire process. So when I struggled with something and wrote about it, they loved it. When something went well, they were super excited. And so that helped build the momentum. And then I would also see them posting like, oh my gosh, my girl Brittany's got a book coming out in December. And like they'd be so excited because we're friends and that's exciting. So share that process with them. Like if yeah. you don't have a title yet, ask your readers what they think it should be called. Like anything to make them feel involved in this process, that's organic reach and public and publicity for your book every single day. Right. And and when you get your book, when it arrives, because they'll send you a you know, a case or whatever of them. When you get it, 
you see them all over the place, right? Somebody's holding up their book and they got a picture and, and get that out there and just scream it from the rooftops. Yeah, absolutely. Be excited about be it. Excited people will be excited because they're going to be so excited. I think yeah. I had like a crying selfie every time I got my book the yeah. first time. And then when you go into the bookstores too, so yeah. I went into my oh, yeah. word, uh, like I went into Barnes and Noble and you go and every you're time. like going and you're finding it. I had, mine was in Target, so yeah. I went into Target. That was a huge deal for me, right? Yeah. So I went into Target and I'm like, oh, I can't find it. You know, and I'm using the app trying to find the stupid books. But I did find it and then you're, you, you know, picture on Instagram and Facebook. Yeah, anytime you can. People want to be excited for you too. Yeah, behind the scenes stuff and also have you thought about doing a day in the life or a week in the life you know share with your readers what this process has been like for you yeah because it's a harrowing process and so they will appreciate that behind the scenes whether it's just pictures or a post too for sure mm -hmm. my publisher told me that i wasn't supposed to be sharing anything yeah you, all the, all the well you can do it without right you can do those little yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, also another thing is um, when I talked about burying the dead, like things I had to cut out of the book that didn't make it, those pieces actually made great blog posts leading up to the book. And I teased mm. them as such like, oh, this is from the cutting room floor. And then I would toss it in. And, and, and it was a great way to sort of um, hype my book before coming out because it'd be essentially a cheat chapter that wasn't in the book. So I was giving readers that and it was another great way. So if you know something that's already going to be cut, Offer it up as you know a sneak peek to your readers. Great idea, and you should ask your publisher too that if you're allowed to reprint any, if you have reprint rights to any of the pro it's it's vertical gardening. So any of the chapters or the projects that you make in there, um, I did that with mine so that I have a craft blog, and so I can post a certain number of my crafts, and then I just say from my book, and I have it linked in there to Amazon. So link to yourself on Amazon, and I have um, for my. I have all five of my books in like a graphic that I made and it, it's on the bottom of every one of my posts. So yeah, make sure you have it on your blog, you have it on your page, front and center. It should be, be right there. Exciting. Yeah, yeah. Congrats. congratulations. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> so I have a cookbook coming up in October. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. So my question is the, like the title is already there on Amazon and you can pre-order it. So should I be sharing it with my yes. readers now? Because yes. Okay, I should. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. But I thought it's too early because it releases no. in October. If it's out, if it's out for pre-order, yeah, I mean, get it I out there. I mean, I have already shared with them that I am writing a cookbook and it is coming in October, but I haven't really shared. The What's the name of your book? Uh, it's Indian vegetarian cooking in the instant pot. Okay. Oh, oh that'll be popular. <laughs> um, yes, you should be sharing it now. If that link is live, you need to yeah. start accumulating those things, especially on sites like Amazon. I mean, you start, you rank on Amazon even before your book comes out. Yeah. So, you know, my book would sit um, in the tops of different sections months before it came out. That means it gets seen more on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Amazon wants to show off things that are selling okay. and they don't even have to be out yet. Okay. So share that all the time. Okay. And do you have a cover yet? Yes. Okay, so yes. I would definitely be... It's already there, uploaded. Okay, yeah, I would definitely be sharing that and talking about it and just tell people how excited you are. You can't wait till it comes out and yeah. Okay, Definitely. Mm-hmm. Anyone else? No. Okay. Well, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you.